One of the most important narratives during this pandemic has been the viral spread of rumors, half-truths, and conspiracy theories. Digital technologies have created an information deluge. It's impossible to keep up with the flood. But these technologies have also changed the flow of information in the world. What does this mean during a crisis when we need to make rapid decisions under extreme uncertainty and we need to act collectively? Today's episode is about sense-making in crisis. I have two brilliant guests. Kate Starbird is Associate Professor at the University of Washington. Kate is an expert in how communications technologies are used during crises. And Victor Gallas, an Associate Professor and Deputy Director of the Stockholm Resilience Center here at Stockholm University. Part of his work looks at the spread of online disinformation. Welcome to Rethink Talks. Okay, uh, welcome to Rethink Talks. Uh, good to have you here, Victor, here in the, the Stockholm studio and, and Kate speaking to us from Seattle. It's uh, brilliant you could uh, both join. So, Kate, Victor, please introduce yourselves and tell us what is the most surprising thing that has happened uh, in the last six months relating to, to misinformation, disinformation uh, and this, this pandemic? So, um, this is Kate Starbird, I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington and actually, and I've been studying for a long time the use of social media during crisis events and specifically misinformation and disinformation. And actually, I would say, you know, for the most part, especially early on with the pandemic, there weren't a lot of surprising things. I think the volume and the scale of the event and the amount of people that were um, that were converging to talk about it and, and therefore the amount of misinformation, disinformation might have been, um, you know, higher than anything we'd ever seen. But in terms of the kinds of things we were seeing, it was almost uh, you know, very predictable um, in, in some of the ways that, uh, that we'd seen events happen before in terms of you know, certain kinds of rumors, you know, people trying to get things right, uh, trying to figure things out and, get, and getting it wrong sometimes. And then eventually we started to see this increase of the politicization and the shift from more misinformation to disinformation. But all of that, you know, looking back from the research that we've done before and other folks have done before, you know, a lot of that would have been expected, um, except for the scale and then the extent, the length of the event has really allowed the politicization and the spread of disinformation to to kind of push aside, you know, people trying to get things right and get to the truth and kind of get displaced by, by trying to score political points and, and push certain kinds of ideologies. And in the U.S., COVID-19 is, is meeting up with election 2020, uh, and that is making things, you know, increasingly um, uh, politicized and, and gives opportunity for the spread of especially domestic disinformation. Oh. Victor. So I'm Victor Galas. I'm Associate Professor in Political Science and Deputy Director at the Stockholm Resilience Center. I think one of the things that surprised me, besides from the scale, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Kate, I think has been the way that, that this pandemic has been sort of brought together in social media with climate issues, uh, sort of spread of misinformation around climate change and the way climate denialists sort of repeat the same type of formula to to, uh, to challenge uh, COVID science, etc. I think that was a little bit surprising to see these two questions being mixed in social media. Now, we, we're we going to talk a lot about misinformation and disinformation. Maybe we'll just start by sort of clarifying what these, these two terms two terms mean, Victor. That's a perfect question for Kate because she has <laughs> a very sophisticated thinking on that that I've been following. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can take that. Uh, so we talk about the, you know, simplistically, the, differ the difference is intent, right? So misinformation is information that's false, but it's not necessarily intentionally false, whereas disinformation is mis false or misleading information that um, is intentionally produced or intentionally spread for an objective, like a political objective or a financial objective. And those two distinctions are, are really important as we think about how platforms might want to address it and even how we, how we think about our own engagement in some of these spaces. 
Okay, and um, and and Kate, you you run uh, you're setting up this this cri- crisis um, information center, and you're you're working in this um, in space of crisis informatics. You, t- tell us a little bit about this this research domain and the lab. Yeah, so I've been working in crisis informatics for quite a long time. In fact, my advisor at the University of Colorado was one of the founders of that field uh, that looks at sort of the use of technology during crisis events. Um, For the center, it's actually a little bit different than that, but we're setting up a new center at the University of Washington with four other colleagues there on, um, it's called the Center for an Informed Public to try to combat uh, misinformation and disinformation in online spaces. But one of my longtime colleagues is one of my um, colleagues there, and she and I, Emma Emma Spiro, and I have been doing this research on misinformation during crisis events. So it's actually one of the strengths of the center, even though that's not our only focal point. Another another, uh, strength of the center is the study of science misinformation. And so COVID-19 puts that all together where we have sort of the uncertainty of the science and the science being politicized and, and used in misleading ways, kind of meeting up with um, with misinformation in online spaces. And, and, and so there's some really interesting dynamics right there at the, what turn out to be the strengths of our center. Cool. And, and is health more susceptible to disinformation, misinformation? Is there a bigger volume of uh, the, uh, uh, these kind of events in, in this area than in, in other areas? I mean, I'm thinking there was like a, a, a study out a few months ago showing that, you know, Eight uh, percent of people during the the, the U.S. election in twenty sixteen uh, had had seen and believed fake news, and um, it's sixteen percent during the, the, this time. Um, and it uh, is it is is health a sort of a critical sort of touch point for people? In terms of what makes us vulnerable to misinformation, crisis events themselves make us vulnerable to misinformation, especially when there's uncertainty. Um, about what's actually going on and anxiety about what we can do um, to uh, prevent harm or what we can do to protect ourselves or take action to respond to the crisis event. And so the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has both uncertainty and anxiety and it has it for an extended period of time. And so absolutely this makes us acutely vulnerable to you know, going out to seek information, to come, trying to come up with explanations of what's going on to help us make better decisions and therefore um, to being vulnerable both both to misinformation when people are accidentally getting things wrong and disinformation when people are intentionally trying to manipulate us. Mm. Cool. And with them, um, and w- let's talk about the origins of this misinformation, you know, it, where with 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 COVID, it's, um, you know, wh- where is it coming from? We're seeing, you know, the EU blaming China for, for, for disinformation. Uh, we're seeing that the media um, is also a source in some ways of uh, spreading um, uh, disinformation and misinformation. Um, and so, uh, could, who, you know, how do you, how do researchers think about think about these origins and the flows of the um, the information? I mean, I, I can just mention the things that I've studied a little bit more closely, and then Kate can follow up. But I mean, the study that we did on the Eat Lancet uh, planetary health diet. Um, report and and misinformation around that report and these reports around the climate and environmental benefits of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that sort of misinformation grows very organically. I would say it's very, very bottom-up. It's it's misunderstandings that sometimes are not intentional, sometimes are intentional, but that's very difficult to assess from the outside what the intent is. But it's just something that grows within these circles of people that are connected, have particular views uh, on the world, um, and, and that just starts to diffuse. And, and of course, you do see much faster propagation of, of those misunderstandings when high-profile social media personalities picks it up. Uh, I mean, in the example of the Amazon and the Amazon fires uh, last year, I mean, this tweets going around that the Amazon are the lungs of the planet and that they create 20% of the world's oxygen, which is not true. I mean, it, it, it's factually incorrect. But you see people like Cristiano Ronaldo tweeting that and you see uh, the French president. Uh, and that just moves very quickly in social media. So, I mean, what I've seen in the things that I, we've studied here, it's very, very organic. Yeah, I would I would echo that. There's there's this combination. We we've, we've been studying this of, of trying to 
to differentiate between the organic components and the sort of uh, intentional components. It's really hard because they're, they're so integrated. And with a crisis event, most of the misinformation we were seeing, especially early on, is just this natural collective sense-making process of people trying to get it right. And sometimes they, they come up with, with explanations that aren't, aren't quite correct. But when we see disinformation actors that try to manipulate the space come in, what they do is they selectively amplify misinformation that might feed, you know, might fit their objectives in, in some ways. They might try to shape those um, collective sense-making processes. And, um, and then we have conspiracy theory communities. So communities that have these shared epistemologies that are basically don't trust anything. Um, and, they, uh, and they generate these things just organically because of the way they see the world and, and that spreads as well. And so we've got all of those dynamics and then occasionally folks trying to, to seed you know, see the misinformation, see the disinformation and, and amplify it. And that can be a, a range of different actors. And here in the US, um, we, we've definitely highlighted, you know, Russian interference in 2016 and, and showed where, you know, certain um, accounts that are associated with Russia had been part of spreading disinformation. But currently, I mean, what, what we're seeing is mostly domestic efforts. Um, people in, inside the US, some, you know, with an ideology or a political motive or a financial motive, um, selectively am amplifying things or even seeding new disinformation narratives to try to, you know, you know gain something, whether that's more followers for their accounts or um, votes for something in the future or, you know, change people's ideologies or push for opening up earlier, whatever it is. Um, we, we see a, just a lot of folks and, and social media makes it possible for a lot of different people and a lot of different entities to, to, to participate in that with it being very difficult to, to figure out who they are. And it's been interesting. I mean, there's this now just so much more research coming out on uh, the spread of information on social media. I mean, that's one of the benefits is that we just have access to so much data on it. Um, but um, it's the you know, it's fake news spreads faster than um, than 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 truth in some way. There's been some interesting research in in that space. Um, can, can we can we talk through um, a little bit about that? You know, what's what are the dynamics there? Things that I, that we know, I mean, from previous previous studies, yes, I mean, so fake news spread faster. Uh, emotional content is also more widely distributed. Content that has images uh, or or visual um, is also tends to be much more seen as much more credible and and also is shared more more widely. Uh, and I think one of the most difficult and intriguing aspects. As I see it, it, I would say it has to do with emotional content uh, and how much information flows are is a mix of facts and emotions that makes it very, very difficult to, to sometimes understand. It, it just requires so much context and it, it's very difficult, as you've mentioned already, to just say this is clearly misinformation or, or an attempt to manipulate something because it's just a mix of different things. Let's talk about the bigger picture here. I mean, you know, uh, we had this like 20 years ago when sort of Google first came on the scene and uh, uh, said, oh, I'm going, we're going to uh, reorganize the world's information and make it uh, universally useful. And that uh, everyone bought into that narrative. And then, then uh, Mark Zuckerberg came along with um, the Facebook narrative that, uh, you know, um, we're going to connect the world. And uh, we kind of bought into these Silicon Valley narratives that were they, were, they, were, they weren't really challenged so much. They were just thought, oh, that, that seems like a, a good idea. What, what, what went wrong? <laughs> I'm not sure who we is there, Owen. <laughs> I don't know what you would say there, Kate. I think there were a lot of very, uh, and a very solid critique very early on. I remember this book from, from the early, I mean, late 2000, beginning of 2010 maybe, called The Myth of Digital Democracy that really showed that, the, the, I mean, the people and the, the groups using media, is not, it's not uh, equally distributed. Uh, there's an elite and, and tends to be to be at advantage of stronger groups in society. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to be a little bit more, you know, admit my, my own participation in, in some of that. I mean, I remember in our in our um, field, human computer interaction, going to conferences even five years ago, um, but certainly you know eight to ten years ago, there was really a celebration not of the platforms themselves, but you know there's a lot of study of them and 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 people talking about what might happen, a lot of celebration of like um, some of the you know revolutions that we we saw as being possibly um, 
motivated by uh, or facilitated by social media with narratives that you know clearly were not um, as as uh, as simple as as some of the you know oh look Twitter is Twitter is you know helping people in Tahrir Square um, so I, I do remember being part of conversations and in the crisis space my my dissertation research was actually on all the pro-social things that people do mm -hmm. on social media during crisis events how they come together they organize volunteer efforts they you know people all over the world converging to help people in Haiti uh, after the earthquake there and so um, there was this sort of like you know this novelty and this this period of you know yeah, hopefulness techno utopianism about all of the things that that those um, those platforms could 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 enable, um, and I remember being you know being part of that to the to the extent of you know the, the research that I was doing was cele you know, celebrating or describing mm -hmm. highlighting the ways that people organize online in, in, in productive ways, and then you know as I became a professor, yes, is, which was 2012. Um, we started to notice a little bit more misinformation. People started talking about misinformation more in the context of crisis events and social media. And I thought, oh, yeah, but it's not that big compared to other things that I've been seeing. So let me go study that. And that over time, as we studied it, it became a bigger and bigger part of of the of the phenomena that we were seeing of people converging after crisis events. And then, you know, around 2014, 2015, we began to recognize that it wasn't just accidental misinformation, which was what we had kind of been looking for um, based on the, on the existing literature about rumors and crisis events, but a lot of it was intentional disinformation. And we were seeing these sort of networks that were um, maybe not designed, but that had emerged it, it, to, to facilitate the spread of disinformation. Hmm. And so there really is both like an early optimism that was way over the top, but also a change, I think, in what um, in how those platforms developed and how people began to use them and appropriate them in ways that became more and more toxic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's pluses and my, even during this crisis, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, social media and digital tools have made it possible for society to function in a way that just couldn't have been possible 20, 30 years mm. ago in a pandemic like this. Um, so this is, you know, it's a very complex area. But mm. at the same time, and you mentioned the, the election coming up in the US, I mean, it is, um, to what extent are they undermining democratic processes now? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, the only thing that I wanted to add to that is that we're still, I mean, we see a lot of collective problem solving at the same time. So, I mean, on the one hand, you do have wide diffusion of misinformation uh, about the pandemic. But on the other hand, you have scientists collaborating 24-7, sharing information, uh, data about the virus, uh, RNA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it speeds up collective problem solving at the same time as we see the this sort of media undermining uh, collective sense making. So I think that that's a paradox that we have to navigate and, we, and we, we often talk about the US here in this but what about the rest of the world in in some places you know whatsapp and facebook are the de facto internet and uh, you know the the spread of mis misinformation the undermining of democracy the uh, difficulties of dealing with these these crises um, yeah. are uh, you know it's 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 happening in a, in a different way in in china then you have the um, uh, you know more um, heavy censorship etc um, uh, what's what's happening in the research community to try to understand those those different dynamics um, in the world yeah i think we the research is not as strong uh, in a lot of other places. We haven't been paying enough attention. Um, but to get to your, your point there, I mean, there's the, what's happening right now in the Philippines, um, for instance, around Maria Reza, who uh, has been um, the founder of Rappler, which was a, a blogging platform that became a news media, media platform there that's been sort of, uh, that tried to call out what the, what the government there, there was doing, becoming more authoritarian and their um, war on drugs, which was, you know, causing vigilante violence. and um she was convicted yesterday mm. on you know they, they've they've sued her for all sorts of different things but she was convicted yesterday i think it goes into sentencing pretty soon but there's a clear like effort by the government to silence um silence democratic voices and if you talk to maria Reza, which i have a couple times been fortunate enough to do she will talk about how facebook um changed what happened 
what was happening there. Mm -hmm. Facebook facilitated this rise of authoritarianism in, in the Philippines, according to Maria Reza. In fact, she brought that to um, Mark Zuckerberg in 2015 and said, you know, if you're not careful, the way your platform works, you're, you're going to bring about the rise of possibly a Donald Trump presidency. And I think she said that Mark Zuckerberg just kind of what, laughed that off, right? But um, it, it turns out that, that that wasn't a bad prediction at all, right? She, she was right. And she really does um, kind of represent both this understanding of what was happening in the Philippines with Facebook becoming this massive way everybody was using it, not everybody, but very close to everybody. And they, um, and, and the way that that worked and the way that they brought people together mm -hmm. allowed for the rise of, of um, authoritarianism through sort of manipulation, through the spread of misinformation and disinformation, and for her, targeted harassment over the course of many, many years. And so it's really a sad case and, and, a, and a very frightening case uh, that's coming to a head right now in, in the Philippines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I can quote um, Brooke uh, Binkowski, uh, a former managing editor of Snopes, this fact-checking site that partnered with Facebook, who said, you know, I strongly believe that uh, Facebook are spreading fake news on behalf of authoritarian governments as part of their business model, uh, which is, um, you know, a, a, an incendiary um, comment to make. Uh, but we're hearing more and more about this. And so, um, so how do you how do you research this, Victor? No, I was just thinking that uh, I don't know whether you agree, Kate, but it's seldom just about one platform, right? I mean, it's yeah. the interaction of platforms. So we we saw that very clearly clearly in our study. Of course, I mean, you do study Twitter because it's easy, but it connects to YouTube, it connects to conventional media, to blogs, uh, TV shows, etc. So, I mean, you always get this mix of media formats. So that means that even though you manage to regulate or address one platform, it's embedded in a whole ecosystem of different other platforms, which makes it much more complicated. Right. Yeah, all these campaigns cross platforms. If when you start to open up any one one campaign, you're going to see. I mean, the Internet Research Agency accounts operated personas across, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, mm. Facebook. Mm. They had they had blog posts that they would make, and then they would have these sort of personas where the same name would be would have all these um, different accounts on these different platforms. And they had SoundCloud that you could go listen to a playlist that they met and had made, and, and you could see you know, the use of all of these different platforms together. One of the difficult things when we think specifically about Facebook, I don't want to pick on one, any one site, um, but we do have a, one platform that is used by the more people than any of the others. Um, and unfortunately, unlike Twitter, where we can collect the data, we have been studying it. We've been calling attention to, to Twitter for a long time and, and the problems there because we've had the data. Facebook, there's not very much that a researcher can study there because we can't collect the private data and the, and the and the conversations that are happening there. Um, they've opened up a few windows into some of their public data, which is great, and I want to commend them for that. But um, but it's it's very difficult to study what's happening there, and for and for good reasons. You know, there there are privacy contracts that they have with their users. Um, at the same time, that makes it very difficult for the outside research community and, and then journalists and everyone else to understand what's happening in Facebook because we can't we can't see the data. Okay, but this is a, a good point. So we, we'll talk a little bit about the solutions then um, and how we can how, we, how can we think about that? I mean, um, can, 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 can we solve this? Who is the we here that uh, can do this solving? Um, is there is there a you know, in the in the COVID there's uh, you know, the R number, we need to get the R number um, below what is there an R number for disinformation <laughs> and misinformation? Can we sort of flatten the curve there? Is there <laughs> are the mechanisms for doing that? I mean, I guess. I do talk about and I think a lot of other folks have, have decided there's there's at least three different um, approaches to addressing um, the pervasive spread of misinformation, disinformation on, on online, in online spaces. Uh, and one of that is in education. Um, and by education, I don't mean um, just university or high school as we would call here, but um, we said K through 99. So from kindergarten all the way through into the elder living facilities here is that you know we, we have to help people understand better what role we play in in this in the spread of this in the spread of misinformation and i guess with your flattening the curve metaphor i think that is a good one is is that if we actually understand that when we spread something this is causing that curve you mm -hmm. know to go higher and and that and that we actually could be correcting ourselves and for years we told people not to correct others because there was a backfire effect now we don't actually think that's happening but we also haven't taught 
um, and some of the platforms don't support well, uh, our own ability to correct ourselves when we make a mistake. So we've been trying to encourage people to a kind of understand where we, where you as a user, where we as, as participants in these spaces are and that our actions do mean something. They do make a difference, just like voting. Like, it seems like, oh, I'm just one little tiny thing that's happening. But actually, if we all were a little bit more careful about what we were spreading, and if we all uh, develop these norms around correcting things in an empathetic way, correcting things that we see that aren't correct, um, and then correcting ourselves when we made a mistake to retract that information, but also to tell people that we've made a mistake, I think that would, would go a long way to, to starting to, 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 to change that curve. No one thing is going to make is going to make all of the difference, but I think um, there's an opportunity there. There's also opportunity in the platforms to work differently, both about how they optimize for engagement. They could optimize for other kinds of more productive conversations that weren't just having people spend more time with their eyeballs on the screen. Uh, and I think that would go a long way. They could do a better job of designing the platforms to help people better understand where they're getting those that information, so they can make better decisions. Right now, we're really we really don't have a lot of tools when we're seeing content to understand where it came from, how it got to us, who created it, who might have amplified it. And so we can't even make those decisions that we might want to be making. Where next for science then? Where are the really interesting areas um, of uh, research around misinformation, disinformation? What are the interesting questions that are exciting you guys? I, th I'm, I think issues around automation, uh, automation of news, uh, social bots, etc., are intriguing, very difficult, uh, and at times very overhyped. But I, I think that there's something uh, interesting and scary happening at, at the moment in, in digital media on things that when 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 news become much more sort of automated uh, uh, and and we start to interact with machines rather than with other people without knowing it intentionally, and that that creates what we complexity scientists call emergent properties that we don't really uh, have a good um, overview of. I think that's challenging. And of course, this uh, being an issue related to stuff like climate change and, and the stewardship of our biosphere, I think that's a really underdeveloped field. I think these studies have mostly so far focused on political campaigns, health issues, but very little on, on things that we are interested in at SRC. Kate. Yeah, I think right now for me, there's a couple things, a couple unanswered questions that would be um, really helpful if we could make up some progress on, and they're hard. And the, one of them is impact uh, of misinformation, especially of disinformation, to think about how we could measure it. I think there's a lot of um, possibility on on both the overhyping of the of of the effects of disinformation and also the um, uh, it, it, the ability for um, folks like Facebook to say, or or social media platforms, or someone else to say, oh, none of this matters. There's no there's no evidence of impact. So therefore, we didn't, you know, we didn't. Our platform didn't facilitate something that had this impact or that but impact because you can't measure it. I think both of those are actually dangerous, both the overhyping and the under, um, and the you know the ability to underplay what might be happening. So I think it's really important to figure out ways to measure, not just the maybe first order effects, but second order effects on how disinformation changes norms, changes how people um, feel about institutions, uh, things like trust, um, especially in our understanding of disinformation as a, as a as sort of an attack on democratic institutions, um, where it undermines our ability to trust information, to trust each other and to come together to kind of um, govern ourselves. And so with that, I think it would be really important to be able to measure the impacts of these campaigns in ways that could um, help us address some of those things. On the other side, very different, I think there's a real opportunity on um, better designs of platforms to help people make better decisions. So how do we, not, not through censorship, to, you know, not, not flattening the curve through censorship, but how do we help people have the information they need to make better decisions, whether that's, you know, showing them certain kinds of cues, forcing them to click through an extra box when they're retweeting someone that they don't know, whatever it is, um, you know, showing them where, not just where the information they, they're looking at initially came through, but how did it get to you? Who was the big influencer that, that reposted that, 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 that led that to get to you? I think these things could have value. 
um, in ways and we don't exactly know what the best designs would be. So I think both areas are really interesting to our group right now. This is a good uh, a good place to um, uh, to finish. I'm going to my, my final question today is so what book would you recommend to um, for for our audience to um, to make sense of the the world in this uh, this mm. current state in this uh, uh, digital firestorm? Mm. Should I go first? I, I found this book marvelous. It's called Emotional AI: The Rise of em Empathic Media by Andrew McStay, uh, and I think essentially what it does is is that it explores the way that that data about our state and, and emotional states is getting increasingly collected by someone through gadgets, uh, mobile phones, smartwatches, smart homes, etc. And, and what that means in terms of trying to nudge or predict and, and uh, alter human behavior through our emotional states. In, super interesting. I think it was very eye-opening and, and it just touches down on many different sorts of technologies all the, all the way from smart homes to facial recognition technologies, etc. And of course, media and bots, etc. Thank you. Kate? One is uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Oh, that's a great um, book. Which I love talks that book. Pardon me? I love that book. Yeah, no, it's it talks about um, the uh, sort of how the devices and the platforms that we use are making us into a commodity by um, using our behaviors and selling that to advertisers and how that we're um, being surveilled and that it's been turned into, um, well, it, into money for, for, for companies. And I, I don't think that the, the relationship, the misinformation and disinformation isn't direct, but it is, it, it is a part of why we're, um, why these platforms are optimized for attention, for keeping us in the seats and, and, and these kind of unhealthy things that, that, that are manifesting there are in part due to like how we're um, due to the economic models that the, these platforms have been, been built around. So Kate Starbird, Victor Gallas, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. All right, thanks.